Hey, good morning. This is Pastor Jack C. Pigeon. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at West Houston Christian Center, and we're just honored that you've joined us to watch this broadcast. You know, a lot of time and prayer and preparation goes into our services because we believe that God has something for you today. There are all kinds of opportunities to catch up with West Houston Christian Center. You can give online, you can follow us through social media, you can join us on Facebook, or just go to our website, westhoustonchristian.com. Any way that we can minister to you through any medium, we are open and excited to do it. Man, we are just thrilled and honored that you've joined us. Enjoy the service, and we pray that God has something for you today. Well, we're talking about training up our spirits. Amen? This is what we started talking about last week, and I want to kind of do a part two tonight. Training our spirits. Now, let me do a little background. How many of us know that when God created Adam and Eve... They were a spirit being. Amen? They possessed a soul, but they had a body. But their spirit was the part that was, had the ascendancy over the three. Body, soul, and spirit. Does everybody understand that? They were spirit beings. They were made in the very image and likeness of God. They were clothed with the glory of God, just like God was. So all the funny little pictures about Adam and Eve running around naked with a snake and an apple, not scripturally accurate. They were clothed as spirit beings, just like God is clothed right now, in the glory of God. So their spirit was making all of the decisions for them. How many of us know that if your spirit is making all of your decisions for you, you're always going to make the right decision? Amen? Satan did not tempt them in their spirit. He tempted them in their soul. He tempted them with something that she could see. Satan cannot touch your spirit. It is closed off, housed off, and sealed off. It is waterproof, airtight, fire-resistant, Amen. Nothing can penetrate the spirit because it's the same spirit that God has in him. Amen. Amen. So Adam and Eve are spirit beings, and they were given a, a, a wonderful opportunity. I mean, they were brilliant. These were not two little cavemen, women, that were trying to hobble out a little bit of an existence in a cave somewhere back in the day. These were big, strong, beautiful intellectual people, I mean, imagine, made in the very image of God, but their spirits, the part that was alive to God, see, I even wonder this, and this is, this is up for speculation, I wonder if up until the point where they partook of the fruit, did they ever hear God speak a word, or was everything just spirit to spirit? Because they're both spirit beings, Amen. Was it when they heard with, those, with their ears the first time, Adam, where art thou? Where are you? Because when the glory dropped, that's all they had left was just their ears. So they're clothed with the glory of God. Their spirit was supposed to have ascendancy over the three. All our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotion, all it was supposed to be was this just like navigation system for us. Amen? We were to program. Anybody have GPS in your car? All the soul was, is I'm going to program my GPS, and it's going to go where I tell it to go. Have you ever gotten in your car, gotten out your phone, and your phone starts calculating something for you that you didn't ask it to do? That's a little weird. (laughs) Amen? Well, that's what happened in the garden. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, and we don't know what fruit it is, it doesn't say an apple in the Bible. Amen? Most likely it was a fig. Because that's the first leaf they looked, they grabbed and covered themselves with. Amen. If you were, you know, in the fig tree and ate it and the glory dropped, well, that's a better, that's a better leaf over there. Let me go cover myself up with that one. We don't know what it is. So anyway, when they partook of that fruit, they died spiritually. The spirit died, the mind, the will, and the emotion, it took ascendancy, and we became feeling we became five physical senses ruled. I am now ruled no longer by my spirit, which is pure and from God, but now I'm ruled by what what I see, what I hear, what I touch, what I feel, what I smell. Those are the things 
that rule me now. And their bodies did what? They started going into decay. Now, they, it took them 900 years to learn to talk themselves into dying. It took them 900 years for them to talk themselves into that body enough where it would actually die. So we were created in the very image and likeness of God. We were made as spiritual beings. Well, how do I know? I was just thinking about this today. How do I know if I'm being more spirit-led or if I'm being more soul-led? Amen? How many, of us, how many of us really know that this is an area that we need to get better at? I think training our spirits is the most important thing that a believer can do. I'm not talking about training your soul. That's got to come also. That's your mind, your will, and your emotion. That's the renewing of the mind, and they both happen the same way. But I'm talking about actually training our spirit, just as Adam and Eve had their spirits trained where they could walk with God in the cool of the day, commune with God, Amen. They were able to do a million, they were able to do multiple things. Amen. Because they weren't limited. How many of us know that our minds have limitations? But they were had an unlimited supply of everything they ever needed. Amen. So I really think it's very, very important for us in this age to develop our spirits. If here's a here's a couple of telltale signs. If I spend most of my day thinking about me. I'm living out of my soul. If I am more concerned about how I feel, and if I am always talking about how I feel, that is living out of a soulish realm. Come on. I feel this way about that. I feel this way about that. Folks, I am the chief sinner preaching and teaching to you this today. (laughs) Amen? I'm always, it's, it's just natural, isn't it? That's the natural man. Well, how do you feel today? We don't even say that. We don't say, well, well, how's your spirit doing today? (laughs) Spirit? You'd think you were a weirdo or something. How's your spirit feel today? Well, I don't know if I could find it. I'd talk to it, but I don't know where it is. Amen? If, If people bother me, I'm living out of my soul. Amen? Because... Living out of our spirit, first and foremost, is going to come out of living out of our love. The love that God has for us and our love for each other. Amen? In heaven, get this, in heaven, they don't talk about earthly things. They're not concerned about elections. They don't check bank accounts. They don't know about the homeowners association and what they want. They're not thinking about fixing the fence in the backyard. In heaven, what are they thinking about? Spiritual things. Amen? We need to almost start living like we're already in heaven and keep our mind focused on spiritual things. Now, that doesn't mean walking around acting weird. Um, You know, I'm super spiritual. No, that means you're super weird. (laughs) Amen? Being spiritual is simply just spending time in the Word. We'll get into it. Meditating in the Word, repeating the Word, and acting on the Word. That's a spiritual person. And there's nothing weird or goofy. There's no voices involved. A lot of times when we talk about walking in the Spirit, it's kind of like when some ministers are preaching, and they're preaching along, and all of a sudden they stop and they go, Okay, Lord. Yeah, yes, Lord, I heard that. I'm like, what, what, did, what did he say? You know, I want to, and, and that's true. That's a very highly developed spirit that's able to do that. Many of us, when we're preaching and teaching, we'll get revelation while we're preaching and teaching. It just goes along with the anointing and with the gifting. So all of a sudden, you're saying something, preaching something, teaching something, and you're like, man, I got to write that down. That was good. Because it came out of the spirit as you were preaching and teaching. So in heaven, they're only thinking about heavenly things. And so what we're going to concentrate on is trying to live a little bit more like we're already in heaven. So if you'll bear with me a little bit, I want to do a little little backup. How long does it take to become a lawyer? So to be a lawyer, I'm so glad you asked because I did some research for you. 
How long does it take to become a lawyer? First, you have to have a four-year undergraduate degree. Got it? Four-year undergraduate degree. You have to have high enough grades to get into law school. You know, it's D's for degrees in college, but if you want to take it a little bit higher, if you've got to have good enough grades, anybody ever go to law school? Okay, <laughs> I can say whatever I want, no problem. <laughs> you have to have high enough grades to get into law school. Now you have three years of actual law school. You've got to, after the three years of law school, you have to take and pass the state bar exam even to get your license. The average cost per year for law school, and they're, they're, they're so wide ranging, but the average is about $37,000 a year for law school. So add three years of that, your four years of undergrad, you've spent close to $180,000 to $200,000 to become a lawyer. Amen? That's a lot of money. How many of us know that attorneys, they also have to what's called have continuing education? Just because you get your license that one time doesn't mean you're done learning. You continue to learn all the course of your term as a lawyer. Is everybody with me? All right. My, my daughter can help me with the next one. How long does it take to become a doctor? Too long. Once again... Four years of an undergraduate. What's your undergraduate going to be in? What she just said. Four years of that. She's, say it again, say it loud. Good. So you have to even take that to be even considered for medical school. Amen? So you do your four years of undergraduate. You have to do, um, at the end of the four years, you have to take what are called the MCAT, which Emily's going to be taking in July, next month, her MCAT, which is kind of like the SAT for medical school. Amen? And you got to do really well on that. Out of that, if you make a high enough um, grade, you get accepted into a medical school which is what we're believing for, that she'll be here in Houston getting accepted into a medical school. Amen. After that, she'll have four years of medical school. Four more years. After that, she'll have three to seven years of a residency, to concern, just depending on which we already know what she wants to do, which is going to be pe trauma pediatrics. Is that still what you're doing? She wants to work with children in trauma situations. Isn't God amazing that God can put that into somebody to want to do it? You know what I mean? I'm just amazed at, the, at God. He's so unique and so personal. And so after her three to seven years, depending on her field of residency, she'll be eligible to get her license. She'll have a continuing education for the duration. As long as she's a doctor, Emily will constantly have, because as we know, science changes every day. Amen. So she'll have continuing education all through the course of her, uh, of her practice. Um, the average cost of medical school is about $50,000 a year. That's an average, a year for medical school. On top of the undergrad, it's, it's amazing. But let me just be real honest. I think the hardest thing in the world should be to be a doctor. I just do. I don't think that it should be crack a book and, you know, maybe come to class, maybe don't. If you're going to take someone's life into your hands, I think they need to have gone through as much training and preparation time as humanly possible. Amen? So I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always, you know, as a dad, I'm like, why has it got to cost so much? But I'm glad that there's a process in place to protect both her as a doctor and the people that she's going to be caring for. Amen. Human life is the single most precious thing on the face of the earth. And if she's got healing hands and the anointing of God in her, Amen. when she gets that child, she's not just diagnosing, she's praying in tongues over this child and, and, and speaking healing into him or her in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're excited about that. 
So um, their her average cost is about $50,000 a year for medical school. The cost for both to be a lawyer and a doctor are very high, but the reward on the other end is also very high. It costs a lot, but I think that with the, the numbers that I saw today, to a first year attorney makes $140,000 a year starting. Starting. $140,000 a year. Emily, I don't know, I could be off on this, but I'm praying I'm not. A first year doctor, because daddy wants a Corvette, the first year doctor <laughs> can make anywhere between one hundred and twenty dollars to $200,000 a year. Amen? Now, is there sacrifice involved for both of those things? Yes. Amen? Is there discipline involved for both of those things? Both engineers, right? You both got four-year degrees. You both went and got your master's. You both have done, you did continuing education all through the end. You just recently retired. But you put a lot of time. Did you sacrifice to do what you did? Did you? There was sacrifice. So, and I said, I'm saying all that to say this. If we put that, time, that much time and effort into develop what we're doing here in the earth, how much more should we be putting into our spirit? Because that's the part that talks to God. And what we do is we kind of shove the spiritual side over in the closet. We try and see how intellectual we can get about the things of God. We get real heady about it. But the reason that people aren't in our churches is because there's no power anymore because we've turned it into a theology and a doctrine and we've explained away all the miracles and all the healings. And if we would actually just take the time and develop our spirits, we would walk in the same miracles of the book of Acts. But it takes time, sacrifice, and the word that nobody likes, discipline. We have to discipline our souls. We have to discipline our spirits. We got to want it. Does that make sense? We all want change. How many of you want change? How many of us want change? We all want change. Everybody wants change until it's time to change. Yes, Pastor Jack, I want change. I need change. All right, do this, this, and this. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Whoa, slow down. I really want change, but I don't know if I want change like that. We all want change until it actually costs us something. Amen? We all want change. We all, we all want to sit, men, we all want to sit at home and we watch these guys play these sports and make these millions and billions of dollars and think, I wish I could be doing that. But we didn't do what they did in order to put themselves in that position to get that contract. There is nobody that has attained a high level of anything that did not live some sort of a disciplined, sacrificial type of life. They had to die to a lot of things. Luke and I, uh, he's not in the room, but we finished our baseball career last night. And uh, Luke played his last Little League game. I coached my last Little League game. And we've been doing it for 12 years. And we played uh, in a little district tournament, and I took the 12 best kids from my league, and we did a tournament out at Post Oak, and, and, and we played some of the best. And we got up against a team last night, and uh, they were machines. They just absolutely annihilated us. And you know what? They never said a word to us. They just came out there, and they just played like they, were, they let their playing do all the talking for them. It was funny because the team I played before that, we did to them what was done to us last night, and they were talking trash the whole night. And I'm like, the weakest one in the room is the loudest one in the room. When you know that you know that you know, we got up against a team last night, and they were proficient. These young men, they play baseball year-round. They're 12 and 13 years old, and they play year-round, and they sacrifice. They don't go on vacations. They play these tournaments. And that's all that they know, all that they know, all that they know. There is sacrifice to do anything at a high level. Any sacrifice in the military, Mr. Wright? 
you was just a weekend soldier, right? You just went in on Fridays and Saturdays, and Mondays you got to kind of do your own thing, wear what you wanted to. <laughs> was there any discipline involved, sir, in the military? Any sacrifice? Huh? How about this? Anybody that's ever done anything, was there ever any time in the midst of it if you wondered, what am I doing here? <laughs> Folks, it will get like that. The deeper we get into the things of God, listen to me, this is so important. The deeper we get into the things of God, the closer we get, the more of the things that we need to deal with are going to come into the light. And you're going to have a choice. What do I do with this thing? This is the thing that if I can just deal with this thing, it's going to help me get to the next thing. But a lot of time what happens is, is we look at this thing and we go, it's just too hard. I, I can't deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. And God's saying, if you'll just deal with this one thing, I can help move you. The closer you get to me, see, the closer we get to him, it's like the more undressed we become in the spirit. The closer we get to him, the more we're aware of our imperfections and our frailty. The closer we get to him, we're like, okay, God, I trust you. I believe you. I know that you know what's better for me than I do. So, Lord, I'm just going to lay all this on the table. It's kind of like this. Has anybody ever had a diet, done, done a diet before? Anybody on one now? <laughs> no. Anybody ever been on a diet? Let me just give you some advice. And I, I'm, I'm not a professional healthcare person, but I will give you my two cents. If you're on a diet and at some point you don't become hungry, it's not a good diet. <laughs> if, you're on not, if you're on a diet and at some point you don't get hungry, you're not doing something right. Because you are going to come... When I, when I counsel people, and a lot of people come out of different addictions, and what I try and tell them up front is, is, hey, we're going to take this really slow. We're going to work on this. There's going to be no strings. We're going to do it. We're going to take baby steps. But at some point in this process, you are going to have to say no. You are. I can't do it for you. You're going to get faced, whatever this addiction is, it's going to be looking you right in the face. And at some point, you are going to have to tell that thing no. And the minute you tell that thing no, it will lose its hold on your life. But a lot of us don't want to get to that point. We want other people, not you, but we want other people to do it for us. Everybody wants help as long as you're doing it for me. Amen. You tell me. You motivate me. You call me. You, you do everything for me. You be there for me 24-7, but at some point, if you're really serious about it, you're going to say no. And the minute you do, that's the day of your victory. Amen? The day you look at that cupcake and say, not today, Mr. Ding Dong, no sir. <laughs> the minute you look at that cigarette, anybody quit smoking? Tobacco, drugs, all that kind of stuff? There comes a day where you have to look at it and go, no. Amen. Amen? And really what it is, it's your spirit is telling you, you don't need that. See, what God wants to do is God wants to be our comforter. Yes. But what we've done is we live in a society where there's comfort that comes from everything. There's comfort from food. There's comfort from cigarettes. There's comfort from alcohol. There's comfort from pornography. There's comfort from worry. There's comfort from unforgiveness. There's comfort in all those things, and we draw a little bit of comfort from it. And the minute we do, the Holy Spirit's not able to help us in those areas. But when we give those areas to God, then he's able to move in, and he becomes our comforter in the midst of all of that. Amen? God doesn't want food to be our comfort. It was never created to be our comfort. It was a means to an end. And we've turned it into something far worse than it was ever supposed to be. It's actually used as a weapon against us now. And it was just supposed to be food. That's all it is. Now, if it's good food, no. Amen, are you with me? So, 
minutes. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those that love him. But he reveals them to us by his spirit. Amen? For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So listen to me. We don't even know what we have because everything that God has for us is by the Spirit. So if I don't learn to develop my spirit, I don't even know what's mine. If I don't develop, everything that God has for me is in the Spirit. And if I don't take the time, God is on this super quantum high level. If I never develop my spirit and it says a two-year-old, the two-year-old is never going to understand everything that the provider has for them. So I want to do my best to develop my spirit so that I can have and understand everything that God has me. How many of us know that it's the invisible things that are eternal? It's the things that we can't see, and those are the things that we get by the Spirit. I was telling the young men yesterday, I was trying to give my inspirational talk, you know, before the baseball game, and this is a really good team, and, um, you know, in your heart, you kind of know what's getting ready to happen, <laughs> but you're just trying to soften the blow a little bit, but I felt like, I was like, okay, guys, look, there's no dishonor in getting beat by a better team. That's how sports should be. I, it's not, they didn't cheat, they didn't do anything, they were just better. What is wrong is that if we go into this game and we don't even try. Because now we're getting into things like honor and courage and integrity. And these invisible things are the things that you're going to take into your life as men. No one's going to remember the score of this baseball game in a couple of days. No one's going to remember. Nobody cares. But what we will care about is, is what did you learn in the midst of it that you're going to take with you as a man that's going to help you grow and be a better person. It's the invisible things that are the most important, and the invisible things are the things of the Spirit. Love's an invisible thing, but it's eternal. Amen? Righteousness is an invisible thing, but it's eternal. These are the things. We spend so much time working on the things that we see because that's the society and the culture that we live in. We have to take care of our bodies, don't we? Ladies, did you put any time in your makeup today? I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I'm looking at every lady today. You look gorgeous tonight. Thank you very much. But that didn't just happen, did it? Did it take some time? A lot of time? Not for you, honey. For some of it, it's 10 minutes in the car on the way to church, right? You're doing your thing. Amen. We spend an enormous amount of time just taking care, because that's just the society. We are surrounded by, by advertisements that tell us that we're not good enough. We're surrounded by it, that you'll never be good enough. But if you have this toothpaste, then you're going to be good enough. You can have the deodorant of the stars. Brad Pitt uses this deodorant. If you use this, you'll look like Brad Pitt. I don't know. I'm on a roll tonight. I don't know. <laughs> but we live in a world where we're never good enough, where you never have enough. How many of you feel like that? I never have enough. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And we all get trapped by that, that I don't have enough. I'm not, how about I'm not good enough? How about I'm not smart enough? How about I've made mistakes that no one can ever come back? That is a lie from the pit of hell. And if we would spend more time developing our spirits, we would hear God telling us that. I had a moment in my office this morning. I was really tired. These baseball tournaments have been crazy. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, Lord, i got to preach tonight. And I really did want to preach tonight. I was like, my dad called, and was like, all right, you got it. Hung up the phone. All right, Dad, I got it. But... Um, I was just sitting there like, like, God, what is it that you want from me tonight? And, and just very peacefully, he just said, I just want you. 
Like, okay, Jesus, I'll preach for you tonight. But he wasn't, I wasn't, he wasn't having me get all caught up in trying to put something together. He's more concerned about you as an individual than about, see, a lot of us, and I'm getting a little bit off topic, but that's good, is you're, we're so caught up in a works mentality. We are so caught up in, if I do this, then God will love me. If I do this, then God will give to me. On the other hand, if I don't do this, God will never give to me. God knows that we're not perfect. Amen? Amen. All of us are walking around with this spiritual thing that says, under construction. Each and every one of us, there's nobody in this room that has arrived that no longer needs any help in their life. We constantly need it. But what the world tells us is, is that you have to work in order to get it. Did you have to work for your salvation? Did you have to work for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How did you get those? Is believing a natural thing or a spiritual thing? If we would spend more time developing our faith and less time developing a works mentality... Thinking that I have to earn. Well, you're going to have to be 20 years before you can ever have one of those. Oh, you'll never have a new house. It's going to take you 40 years before you get a new car. Anybody, not, anybody want a new car? Anybody believe in God for a new car? Who has never had a new car before? Raise your hand. Put your hand down. <laughs> Come sit over here with your grandparents. This is a good time right now. <laughs> 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 How many of you have never had a new car? Show me your hands again. A brand new car. Amen. Do you want one? Do you want one? You can have one. Amen. What we get into, though, is like, well, we give all the reasons as to why I can't have a new car. How about a new house? I've had a new house. We've been very blessed. We've been in a new house for 20 years now. <laughs> But it was new. We were the first, we we're the only owners of it. Amen. Anybody believe in God for a new house? Amen. You are not going to be able to work to get that house. If you really want it to be yours and if you really want to enjoy it, you're going to have to get it by faith. And the only way we're going to get stuff by faith is developing our spirits. Amen. If you develop your spirit, you are always going to hear God's voice and you're always going to walk in victory. God's never going to lead you to, to, to poverty. God never led one person into less. Not one person. Even Job, when he got led into less, he got double for his trouble on the way out. Amen? God never will lead you. Wisdom will always lead you to more. It will never lead you to less. Amen? But we have to spend time developing that part of our spirit. Faith is a spiritual thing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Amen? So I need to be constantly, that's when I say, what's your faith project? We need to be constantly using our faith because it is a spiritual thing that I'm doing. I am strengthening my spirit when I am believing God for something. Amen? Hallelujah. So I have to know, I have to develop my spirit in order to know the things that God have, uh, has for me. Two things that are necessary to know the things of God. You ready? There's two things that are necessary to know those things of God. Number one, you have to have a revelation from God. By the Spirit. And we all know what revelation means, right? It is a transfer of ownership. In order for you to get something from God, you've got to see it in his word. You have to get a revelation from it, and it has to transfer ownership of that scripture to you. When you get a revelation, then it's yours. Who has a revelation of a scripture? What is it, June? You know it? Don't worry about it. But we have different, like for me, it's Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. I've been saying it all day, every day for three years now. Amen. Meditating on that scripture. I have a revelation. I have transferred ownership. What I was even thinking on today, 
the blessing of the Lord. It makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. I cannot add to it one bit. My toiling or my working is not going to increase that blessing in my life. It's all from him. Amen. We have a revelation of healing. We have healing scriptures, right? How many of you have been healed from the word of God? Then you got a revelation of those scriptures of Isaiah 53 or whatever you used. You went into the word. You meditated the word. There was a transfer of ownership. You got a revelation. Now you can receive from God through that verse. See, the word of God, those are gateways to get things into you. When I find that scripture that pertains to my situation, I get faith of it, and there's a transfer of heavenly power that comes through that verse into my body. Number two, an appropriate spiritual response. It's one thing to get a revelation about something, but now you've got to do something with it. It's not just enough to get a revelation when what's, what's my part? What do I have to do? The first thing, I have to believe. I have to believe that that verse is for me. I have to believe that when God says that he wants me to prosper and not to be sick, that I have to believe him and take him at his word. I have to believe him. That's my part. So I have to get a revelation, and I have to believe. i got to receive it by faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given to us. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we contact God through the spirit, it's like us going back to the garden. That's just how Adam and Eve received from God. It was by the spirit. They talked to God by the spirit. They communicated, they fellowshiped, they communed. Adam and Eve together, that's how they communed, by the Spirit. Oh, husbands and wives, if we could commune by the Spirit with our spouses, if we could learn how to do that, amen, how much sweeter would the conversation be? But you know what? It doesn't just happen. It takes effort. It takes time. you got to pray together. You have to make time for each other. Amen? Amen. Michelle told me a long time ago, love is not L-O-V-E. Love is T-I-M-E. Amen? That my love, I can bring her cards and flowers and all that kind of stuff, but she doesn't want that. An apple fritter used to do the trick, but she doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> but it's time. Amen? That's the most valuable thing that I can give to my wife is my time. Yeah. Amen? That's the same thing with developing your spirit. The most important thing you can give God is your time. Amen? Spending time listening to the Word, fellowshipping around the Word, just talking to Him. Do you ever just do that when you're alone? Do you ever just talk to Him? Yeah. Talk to Him like He's in the room, because He is. Keep your door shut so when people walk by, they're like, <laughs> are you with somebody right now? Oh, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Walking in the Spirit, my Spirit and God's Spirit, it's like we both started speaking the same language again. It's like before we were speaking two different languages. I couldn't understand what he was saying, but when I develop my Spirit, all of a sudden I can translate what he's saying, and he can tell me what he has for me, and he can share with me all the blessings and all the things that have been freely given to me. Because he's always talking and he's always telling me, but I have to learn how to listen to understand what he's saying. That's why I want to develop my spirit. Amen? So that I can know what he's freely given to us. Just as instruction is vital to any profession in order to be successful, instruction for a believer is vital to train our spirits to be successful. A big part of training our spirit is listening to instruction. Amen? Listening to instruction. It's very, very hard for God to bless somebody who is unteachable. It's very, very, very hard, and I've probably said this before, but in counseling situations, 
you know, we're not, I don't have a PhD or an MD or an ABCD or anything like that in counseling. Amen? Um, I have, I'm 53 years old. Um, I've been in full-time ministry um, 24 years. I've seen a few things that I can maybe help somebody with. I've come out of them some things that I can help somebody with. And so when people sit down with me, I have a little bit of a working knowledge of, you know, I can maybe help you a little bit. I can't prescribe you any drugs or anything like that. I let people know that right up front. I'm not a, I'm not a clinical psychologist. But the hardest person to counsel is this one. When you sit down and you start sharing what you feel like God has for them and they end every sentence with this. Well, I knew that. Well, I know that. Oh, well, I knew that. Well, I, I know that. All right, well, God bless you. There's an offering basket on the way out. You want to drop a little something in there? No. I can't help you. If you already think you know all the answers, I cannot help you because you are unteachable. I deal with that with some baseball kids in my little career. It's, it's, you can just tell how kids have been raised. You have some, Mr. Pigeon, how are you, sir? Yes, sir. Other kids, hey, Jack. I'm sorry, what'd you say? What did you call me? I don't hear a word after that. You can ask me any question in the world, but if you start off my, my name by calling me Jack, I know exactly how you've been raised. Amen? And so we have to train, most importantly, our kids to be teachable. Amen? The greatest thing you can teach your kids is the word no. Can we handle... A few more minutes. Proverbs 4.13. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let it go. Keep her, for she is your life. Proverbs 4.13. Read it again. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. That word instruction includes a form of discipline intended to lead to a transformed life. If you want to learn how to hear God's voice, then we have to learn to obey to do whatever it is that he told us to do. If I'm spending quality time with the Lord, and remember I said the closer we get, the more transparent we become. One of my dad's favorite topics, and I think he's a master at teaching on it, is unforgiveness. If I get close to God, then all of a sudden he's like, okay, you need to forgive X, Y, and Z. We have to act on that. I have to receive instruction in that area in order to progress in the relationship. Now, he still loves you, cares for you, wants to bless you, wants to do all those things, but it's not him that's blocking the blessing. It's me. He's giving me an option. And, when, and really what we don't understand is he's making me an offer that I can't refuse. Because when he steps in and says, when he recognizes it, that means he's going to help us do it. That means now when God steps into it that there's a grace to actually deal with whatever this thing is that's holding us back. I'm making you an offer you can't refuse. Always receive God's offers when it comes to those types of things. Amen? God, and I'll end with this, God wants a deeper relationship with each and every one of us. He longs for it. He wants it. He wants it more than we want it. But he's so incredibly patient. He's waiting for us to come to him where we can get to the point where we can deal with some of these things. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage us Take time every day to work on your spirit. How do you do that? Listen to the word, find a couple of scriptures, and meditate on the word every day. You need to take a scripture, get somewhere, and get quiet for 10 or 15 minutes every day and do nothing but mutter that scripture over and over. It's like chewing on a T-bone steak. You chew, you chew, there's more flavor, there's more flavor, there's more flavor. That's where your revelation, that's where your growth's really going to come from. And I'll give you some steps in a couple of weeks on how to do this. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jack.
Uh, two things real quick. Uh, anybody going through transition right now? Anybody feel like you're just in a place of transition in your life? Amen. One, two, three, four. You're transitioning? Praise the Lord. We'll talk when we get home. <laughs> All right. Um, y'all come down here. If you're dealing with transition, come down here. If you need direction, come down here. Transition on my left, direction on my right. All right, everybody just get in the middle and just join hands. Amen? Come on. Transition. You know that you're transitioning right now. You know that you're in a place of transition in your life. You know it. How do you know it? Because there is a, dis, there is a, a divine dissatisfaction with where you are. That's how you know you're in transition. Direction, you are, you are earnestly, patiently seeking what God's next step for you in your life is. And also in that area, there is a divine dissatisfaction. You're not happy, you're not settled anymore. You were good, but now you know that that's changing and you need to move out of that place. You need to go in a different direction. Amen? <laughs> All right, just grab hands. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My whole family's up here. What's going on? <laughs> Is this like a joke? Is there something happening? <laughs> All right, just close your eyes. Would y'all help me? I need your faith right now. Crowd, congregation, I need your faith. Close your eyes. Just begin to pray in the spirit for a second. Ha raba shanda raba sura bo shanda raba kura ba shanda raba sura ba shanda raba kura. Father, I just thank you for each person that's in this line right now, Father. And Lord, I just thank you first and foremost for their bravery to even admit that Lord that they're in this place in their life. I just prophesy over you that this is a good thing that you are entering into right now. That there is absolutely nothing to fear. God says, I have gone before you and I have prepared a way. And it is through your preparation, it is through your prayer, it is through your fasting that you are going to now enter into this next phase of your life. Men are not going to open doors for you, says the Lord. I am going to open doors for you, saith the Lord. Men are not going to produce comfort for you. I am going to produce comfort for you. I have aligned and set in place from the foundations of the earth exactly where you're supposed to be and exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So now rise up in the strength and in the power of the anointing and of the Lord and take your place in me in this new phase of your life. And in this phase, I have already supplied everything that you need there's nothing lacking and nothing missing. I have supplied everything that you need in every situation. There'll be nothing lacking. For some of you, you feel like you're, you're leaving a whole lot behind, and God's saying, if you could only see what's in front of you, if you could only see what I see, if you could only see what I've laid before you, you would look at that stuff behind you and laugh as it compares to what I have. So rise up in faith. Rise up in this new grace. Learn and endeavor to hear my voice. Compete as an Olympian would for a gold medal. Discipline yourself. Train yourself. Hear my voice. Walk in love. And know that I will never leave you nor forsake you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you receive that, say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You are all dismissed. We will see you Sunday.